Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, today we will be dealing with larynx. I am Dr. Daksha Dikshit, Professor of Anatomy from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Kaili Academy of Higher Education and Research, Belagavi. We will first move on to see a clinical case scenario. A middle aged man had consumed alcohol while having dinner and during the meal he began to suffocate and collapsed on the floor. On close examination, his pulse was found to be strong and his face began to turn blue, that is, he was having cyanosis. He was suffering from asphyxia. A piece of meat had got stuck in the posterior part of the pharynx. He had to be put into a prone position and with hands interlocked against his upper abdomen, pressure had to be exerted on the abdomen two to three times to expel the piece of meat out and the procedure which was adopted to do this is what is called as the Hamlish maneuver. Let us keep this clinical scenario in mind and as we go through the class we will understand what this maneuver is and how it has helped in expelling the piece of meat out from the pharynx. We will be dealing with the topic of larynx under the following headings. Introduction, Extent and Measurements, The Skeleton of the Larynx where we will deal with the cartilages, the ligaments and membranes. Then we will move on to the muscles of the larynx, joints of the larynx, cavity of larynx, the subdivisions of larynx. Then we go on to the nerve supply blood supply which will include the arterial supply and the venous drainage, lymphatic drainage and finally we go on to the applied anatomy. Larynx, it is an organ of respiration and phonation. It protects the lower respiratory passages. It acts as a watchdog by preventing entry of any materials other than air. The picture here shows us a sagittal section through the head and neck. We can see here the epiglottis, the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage along with the vocal cords. So here this is the inlet of larynx and these what we saw are the three cartilages of larynx, the epiglottis, the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. What is the extent of larynx? It extends from the upper border of the epiglottis up to the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. It communicates with the laryngopharynx above and with the trachea below. It lies opposite the third to sixth cervical vertebrae in adults and opposite first to fourth cervical vertebrae in children. Here we see an outline of the larynx showing us how it extends between the cervical vertebrae 3 to 6 in adults. Let us now see the average measurements of larynx. In males, the larynx measures about 44 millimeters vertically. 43 millimeters transversely and 36 millimeters, sorry, I'll repeat. Let us see the average measurements of larynx. The larynx in males measures 44 millimeters vertically, 43 millimeters transversely and 36 millimeters anteroposteriorly, while in females it measures 36 millimeters vertically. 41 millimeters transversely and 26 millimeters anteroposteriorly. Let us now move on to the skeleton of larynx. It is made up of 
laryngeal cartilages which are seen as three paired cartilages and three unpaired cartilages. The three paired cartilages are the arytenoid, corniculate and cuneiform cartilages while the unpaired cartilages are the epiglottis, the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage. So, total 9 cartilages out of which 3 are paired and 3 are unpaired. All the cartilages are highline type of cartilages in structure except the epiglottis, corniculate, cuneiform, vocal process and apex of the arytenoid cartilage which are made up of elastic fibrocartilage. All the highline type of cartilages can ossify as age advances but ossification does not occur in the elastic fibrocartilages. These cartilages are connected by ligaments, synovial joints, intrinsic muscles and membranes and they are all lined internally by mucous membrane. Let us now see each of these cartilages in detail. The epiglottis, this is a leaf like cartilage extends obliquely behind the hyoid bone and the base of the tongue. It presents upper and lower ends, anterior and posterior surfaces and two lateral borders. The picture here shows us a section through the laryngeal cartilages. What we see here a leaf shaped unpaired cartilage is the epiglottis having an upper end which is free and a lower end which is attached by the thyroepiglottic ligament to the posterior surface of the thyroid cartilage. In this picture the thyroid cartilage half of it has been cut and removed so to see a clearer view of the thyroepiglottic ligament. What we see here is the other half of the lamina of thyroid cartilage. We also see the intact cricoid cartilage and the tracheal rings. This surface which we see here facing towards the tongue is the anterior surface of the epiglottis and this is how the posterior surface of epiglottis appears having the epiglottic tubercle on a raised ridge in the midline. So, epiglottis has upper end, lower end, two lateral borders which are related to the eriepiglottic folds and two surfaces an anterior surface and a posterior surface. Now, this picture shows us a superior or a dorsal view through the oral cavity where we can see the dorsal surface of the tongue and when we appear or reach the base of the tongue, we see the upper border of epiglottis. Now, this upper border of epiglottis is attached to the base of the tongue by three mucosal folds one in the midline which is called as the median glossoepiglottic fold and two bilaterally placed lateral glossoepiglottic folds and the space or depression between these three folds is what is called as the vellicula. Another picture here a sagittal section showing us the hyoid bone anteriorly behind it lies the epiglottis. The anterior surface of epiglottis is connected to the hyoid bone by the hyoepiglottic ligament. What we also see here is the cut end of the thyroid cartilage and the lower end of epiglottis which is attached by the thyroepiglottic ligament to the thyroid cartilage. We also see the eriepiglottic fold which is connecting the lateral borders of the epiglottis to the apex of the arytenoid cartilage postero inferiorly. The thyroid cartilage, this acts as a shield. It lies opposite the fourth to fifth cervical vertebrae. The thyroid cartilage is made up of two laminae which meet in front 
at the thyroid angle also known as the Adam's angle or Adam's apple which is more prominent in adult males measuring about 90 degrees while in females it is less prominent at as the angle measures about 120 degrees. The picture here shows us the thyroid cartilage made up of two laminae connected at the laryngeal prominence or the thyroid angle. Each lamina is quadrilateral with four borders that is the superior border, the inferior border, the anterior border which is connected to anterior border of the opposite lamina at the laryngeal prominence and a posterior border. It also shows a superior notch, an inferior notch. Posteriorly, the superior border ends at the superior tubercle and then continues upwards as the superior horn of the thyroid cartilage. Similarly, the inferior border ends in the inferior tubercle and then continues downwards as the inferior horn. The inferior horn and superior horn are connected to each other by the posterior border of the laminae. Also seen on the outer surface of the lamina is an oblique running line which runs downwards and forwards. The thyroid cartilage is connected to the hyoid bone by the thyrohyoid membrane. The superior border as is seen here of the thyroid cartilage is attached to the lower border of the hyoid bone by the thyrohyoid membrane and the posterior border of this thyrohyoid membrane is thickened to form the thyrohyoid ligament. Inferiorly, the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage is connected to the anterior arch of the cricoid cartilage by the conus elasticus or the cricovocal ligament. This ligament is connected or covered anteriorly by the cricothyroid muscle which is attached between the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage. The posterior surface or the posterior aspect of the thyroid laminae show the presence of the thyroepiglottic ligament which connects the posterior aspect of the thyroid angle to the lower end of the epiglottis in the midline and inferior to it we see attachment of a pair of vestibular ligaments and more inferiorly we see attachment of a pair of vocal ligaments. Just on either side of the attachment of the vocal ligaments, from medial to lateral, the thyroid laminae show attachment of three intrinsic muscles of larynx. From medial to lateral, these are the vocalis, the thyroeretinoideus and the thyroepiglotticus. On the outer surface of the thyroid lamina, the oblique ridge of the thyroid cartilage is present which passes downwards and forwards. It gives attachment to thyrohyoid muscle, the sternothyroid muscle and to the thyropharyngeal part of the inferior constrictor of pharynx. The thyrohyoid and the sternohyoid are part of the strap muscles which are seen in the anterior midline of the neck. What is also seen in this picture is the thyrohyoid membrane attaching between the superior border of thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone. We can also see the conus elasticus which is a membrane connecting the inferior border of the thyroid laminae to the cricoid cartilage. Moving on to the cricoid cartilage. It is a foundation stone of larynx. It lies at the level of the sixth cervical vertebra. It is a signet ring shaped structure. It is a complete ring with a narrow anterior arch and a broad posterior lamina. This picture shows us the signet ring shaped cricoid cartilage, a complete ring shaped cartilage having an anterior arch 
and a posterior flattened lamina. It shows two articular facets, one at the upper border of the posterior lamina which is a facet for articulation with the arytenoid cartilage and another facet which is seen at the posterolateral aspect at the junction between the anterior arch and the lamina and this facet is for articulation with the inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage. A sagittal section passing through the larynx shows us again the epiglottis, the anteriorly placed thyroid cartilage, posteriorly we see the arytenoid cartilages, the corniculate and the cuneiform cartilage and inferiorly we have the cricoid cartilage. Here we see the clearer picture of the cricovocal ligament or the conus elasticus which is a membrane attaching from the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage to the cricoid cartilage. The upper thickened border of the cricovocal membrane or the conus elasticus is the vocal ligament. We also see the quadrate membrane here which is extending in the upper part of the larynx. Its inferior thickened border is what forms the vestibular ligament. We also see the airy epiglottic fold here which connects the lateral margins of the epiglottis to the apex of the arytenoid cartilage. The corniculate and cuneiform cartilages lie within the airy epiglottic fold. Inferiorly, the cricoid cartilage is connected to the trachea by the cricotracheal ligament. Posteriorly, it also shows presence of trachealis muscle. The posterior lamina of the cricoid cartilage is broad and quadrilateral. It presents upper border, lower border, anterior surface and posterior surface. In posterior inferior part of the lamina at the junction between the lamina and the anterior arch forms the cricothyroid joint while the upper border of the cricoid cartilage has a facet for the joint between the cricoid cartilage and the base of the arytenoid cartilage to form the cricoarytenoid joint. Lower border of the lamina of cricoid cartilage shows attachment of the trachealis muscle which is attaching inferiorly to the rings of the trachea. Going on to study the arytenoid cartilages. These are paired cartilages, each cartilage being pyramidal in shape. It presents an apex, a base which rests on the cricoid lamina and three surfaces namely the posterior surface, the anterolateral surface and the anterior surface. It has got two processes, a vocal process which is directed anteriorly and a muscular process. Joints formed by the cricoid cartilage is the crico arytenoid joint which it forms with the lamina of the cricoid cartilage. This is a synovial type of a joint which allows both gliding as well as rotatory type of movements. The interior of the larynx again showing us the membranes and ligaments related to the arytenoid cartilages. Right on top we see the hyoid bone anteriorly. Behind it is the epiglottis, the two connected by the hyoepiglottic ligament. Lower down we see the thyroid cartilage, the thyrohyoid membrane, the arytenoid cartilage, the airy epiglottic fold which contains the corniculate and cuneiform cartilages, the quadrate membrane lower border of quadrate membrane 
is thickened to form the vestibular ligament. Inferiorly, we have the cricoid cartilage, the cricovocal ligament, the superior border of cricovocal ligament thickened to form the vocal ligament and on that we see the vocalis muscle. The posterior view of the larynx showing the epiglottis posterior surface, the posterior aspect of the laminae of thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, the lamina of cricoid cartilage, the arytenoid cartilages on either side and the corniculate and cuneiform cartilages. This muscle which we see here is the eriepiglotticus muscle which lies within the eriepiglottic fold running between the lateral border of the epiglottis up to the apex of the arytenoid cartilage. Further extension as the oblique arytenoid muscle from the apex of one arytenoid cartilage going towards the base of the opposite arytenoid cartilage. Deep to or anterior to the oblique arytenoid muscle, we see the unpaired transverse arytenoid muscle which extends between the two arytenoid cartilages. Also seen here is the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle which extends from the lamina of cricoid cartilage going towards the laterally placed muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage. Going on to the corniculate and cuneiform cartilages, these are two paired nodules of elastic cartilage. They are contained within each eriepiglottic fold. The corniculate and cuneiform cartilages are set at right angles to each other. Corniculate articulates with the apex of each arytenoid cartilage. The same is shown here in this picture where we see the arytenoid cartilage, its apex articulating with the corniculate cartilage and the cuneiform cartilages seen superior to them. Now we move on to the laryngeal ligaments and membranes. Extrinsic membranes seen here are the thyrohyoid membrane. This is a membrane which we have seen extending from the superior border of the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone. And the posterior thickened border of the thyrohyoid membrane is the thyrohyoid ligament. The next is the cricotracheal ligament which extends from the lower border of the cricoid cartilage to the tracheal rings below. The next is the hyoepiglottic ligament which we have seen attaching between the hyoid bone anteriorly and the anterior surface of the epiglottis posteriorly. The intrinsic ligaments and membranes are the quadrate membrane which is seen in the part above the vestibular ligament. The lower border of this quadrate membrane is what forms the vestibular ligament. The conus elasticus or the cricovocal membrane which is seen in the lower part of the larynx below the vocal ligament and the upper thickened border of this conus elasticus is nothing but the vocal ligament. We have also seen the median cricothyroid ligament connecting between the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage in the midline and the thyroepiglottic ligament which connects the posterior aspect of the thyroid angle to the lower end of the epiglottis. Pictures showing us some of the ligaments and membranes. The thyrohyoid ligament and the membrane. What we see here is the hyoid bone and inferiorly is a thyroid cartilage. This membrane extending from the superior border of the thyroid cartilage going up towards the hyoid bone. This is a thyrohyoid membrane and its posterior thickened 
border is what forms the thyrohyoid ligament. These structures are pierced by the internal laryngeal nerve and the superior laryngeal artery. Other laryngeal ligaments and membranes seen here. Anteriorly again the hyoid bone, the epiglottis, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, arytenoid cartilage, corniculate and cuneiform cartilages. Ligament seen here, the hyoepiglottic ligament connecting between the hyoid bone and the anterior surface of the epiglottis. The thyrohyoid membrane connecting between the hyoid bone and the superior border of the thyroid cartilage. The thyroepiglottic ligament attaching the posterior aspect of the thyroid angle to the lower end of epiglottis. The quadrate membrane seen in the upper part of the larynx, its lower thickened border is the vestibular ligament. The cricovocal ligament or the conus elasticus, the upper thickened border of which is the vocal ligament. The cricothyroid membrane extending between the anterior arch of cricoid and the lower border of the thyroid cartilage. Now we go on to enumerate the muscles of larynx. These again are extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles. Extrinsic muscles of larynx include the sternohyoid, the sternothyroid, the thyrohyoid. All these three are the strap muscles which are seen in the anterior midline of the neck. Also included here are the inferior constrictor of pharynx that is the thyropharyngeal part and the cricopharyngeal part of the inferior constrictor of pharynx and stylopharyngeus and palatopharyngeus muscles of the pharynx. The palatopharyngeus, stylopharyngeus and the salpingopharyngeus, the three longitudinal muscles of pharynx are inserted by a conjoint insertion onto the posterior border of the thyroid laminae. The intrinsic muscles of larynx include the cricothyroid muscle which acts as a tuning fork, the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle which acts as the safety muscle of the larynx, the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, the transverse arytenoid muscle which is a unpaired muscle seen connecting the bodies of the two arytenoid cartilages from the posterior aspect. The oblique arytenoid muscles which further continue upwards as the eriepiglotticus muscle which lies in the eriepiglottic fold. The thyroarytenoid muscle, thyroepiglotticus muscle and the vocalis muscle which is the voice modulator. Some pictures showing us the extrinsic muscles of larynx. What we see here is the sternohyoid muscle. It is a strap muscle component of the superficial layer of the strap muscles. Just deep to it lie the two deep strap muscles that is the sternothyroid and the thyrohyoid. All these three sternohyoid, sternothyroid and thyrohyoid are the extrinsic muscles for larynx and another one which is seen here is the cricothyroid muscle. Intrinsic muscles. This is a lateral view through the larynx showing us few of the intrinsic muscles. This is the airy epiglotticus muscle extending from the epiglottis going down up to the apex of the arytenoid cartilage and traced further downwards it continues as the oblique arytenoid muscle. Just anterior to it is the transverse arytenoid muscle. This muscle seen here extending from the thyroid cartilage going towards the epiglottis is the thyroepiglotticus. Just postero inferior to it, we see the thyroarytenoid muscle. Then comes the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle, 
and the cut ends of the cricothyroid muscle. Posteriorly, we see the posterior cricoadenoid muscle. This is a posterior view of the larynx showing few more intrinsic muscles. This is the eri epiglotticus extending down up to the apex of the arytenoid cartilages and further continuing down as the oblique arytenoid. So, eri epiglotticus continuing as oblique arytenoid. Deep to it or anterior to it is a transverse arytenoid muscle and Posteroinferiorly, we see the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. Now we see the joints of the larynx. There are three named joints seen connecting the laryngeal cartilages. The cricothyroid joint, joint between the inferior horn of the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage the area at the junction between the anterior arch and the lamina of the cricoid cartilage. It is a synovial type of joint. The next joint is the cricoarytenoid joint formed between the upper border of the lamina of the cricoid cartilage and the base of the arytenoid cartilage. This is also a synovial type of joint which permits both rotatory as well as gliding movement. And the third is the joint between the apex of the arytenoid cartilage and the corniculate cartilage which is the arytenocorniculate joint, again a synovial type of a joint. Let us now see the cavity of larynx. The anterior wall of the cavity is longer than its posterior wall as the inlet is obliquely placed sloping downwards and backwards. The picture here shows us the cavity of the larynx, we are seeing it from the posterior aspect. The interior of the larynx presents three parts or three pairs of mucosal folds. These are the eriepiglottic fold, the vestibular fold and the vocal fold. The upper part of the laryngeal cavity which extends superiorly from the epiglottis upper border and the airy epiglottic folds up to the vestibular folds inferiorly, this upper part of the cavity is called the laryngeal vestibule or the supraglottic cavity. The intermediate area which lies superiorly bounded by the vestibular folds and inferiorly bounded by the vocal folds, this area is called the laryngeal ventricle. Sometimes the laryngeal ventricle shows a deep mucus recess which is extending laterally towards the lamina of the thyroid cartilage. This mucus recess is called the saccule of larynx and it is lined by mucus glands which secrete mucus which lubricates the vocal and vestibular folds. The lower part of the cavity of larynx below the vocal ligaments or the vocal folds right up to the lower end of the cricoid cartilage is called the infraglottic compartment or the infraglottic cavity. Thus, there are three parts of the cavity of larynx, the laryngeal vestibule or the supraglottic cavity, the laryngeal ventricle or the intermediate part and the infraglottic cavity. Another picture showing you the cavity of larynx. This here, the uppermost extent is the laryngeal inlet. The space between the airy epiglottic folds on either side marks the laryngeal inlet. Another space which is seen here between the two vestibular folds is called the rima vestibuli. And the narrow cleft 
between the two vocal folds and the vocal processes of the arytenoid cartilages is called the rima glottidis. So, interior of the cavity of larynx shows these three spaces, the laryngeal inlet on top, the rima vestibuli between the two vestibular folds and the rima glottidis, a narrow cleft between the vocal folds and the vocal processes of the arytenoid cartilages. So, subdivisions of the larynx, the interior of the laryngeal cavity as we have seen is subdivided into three parts, the vestibule which extends from the aryepiglottic folds to the vestibular folds, the sinus of larynx which intervenes between the vestibular and the vocal folds and the infraglottic part which lies below the vocal folds and resembles a truncated cone. The picture here shows us the same. The laryngeal inlet below that is the vestibule extending up to the vestibular folds. The gap between the vestibular folds being called the rima vestibuli. The intermediate part called the sinus of larynx and below that is the infraglottic cavity which begins at the rima glottidis which is a cleft between the two vocal folds. Inlet of larynx or editus laryngis, it is bounded above or superiorly and in front by the upper margin of the epiglottis. It is bounded below and behind and posterior inferiorly by the interarytenoid fold of mucous membrane which is connecting the two arytenoid cartilages. While on either side or laterally it is bounded by the two aryepiglottic folds. The inlet of larynx is bounded by the epiglottis, the aryepiglottic fold and the interarytenoid fold of mucous membrane. This inlet is lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Each aryepiglottic fold contains two muscles, those are aryepiglotticus and thyroepiglotticus, two cartilages, these are the corniculate and the cuneiform cartilages and a fibroelastic membrane which is the upper margin of the quadrate membrane. The inlet of larynx is closed by contraction of the aryepiglotticus muscles which approximate the aryepiglottic folds, while opening of the inlet of larynx is mostly passive and partially assisted by contraction of the thyroepiglotticus muscles. We now go to study the rima vestibuli. As we know that it is a space between the two vestibular folds. The vestibular folds are also known as the ventricular folds or the false vocal cords. They contain submucous areolar tissue and vestibular ligament which is formed by the thickening of the lower free margin of the quadrate membrane. What are the functions of the rima vestibuli? It prevents, sorry I will repeat. Let us now see the rima vestibuli. As we know that it is a space between the two vestibular folds. The vestibular folds are also known as ventricular folds or false vocal cords. They contain submucous areolar tissue and vestibular ligament which is formed by the thickening of the lower free margin of the quadrate membrane. What is the function of rima vestibuli? It permits air entry during inspiration and prevents air exit in expiration thus it acts as an exit valve. 
opposition of vestibular folds which is done during holding of breath at the end of inspiration increases the intra abdominal and intra thoracic pressure which is required during acts of micturition defecation parturition in females and during coughing let us see the rima glottidis or the glottis this is a narrow anteroposterior cleft of the laryngeal cavity seen between the two vocal folds and the vocal processes of the two arytenoid cartilages the sagittal diameter of the glottis measures 23 mm in adult males and 17 mm in adult females the boundaries of the rima glottidis anteriorly or in front it is bounded by the posterior surface of the angle of thyroid cartilage posteriorly or behind it is bounded by the interarytenoid mucus fold and on each side the vocal fold lies in the anterior 3/5 and the vocal process of arytenoid cartilage lies in the posterior 2/5 of the rima glottidis the subdivisions of the rima glottidis are two parts the intermembranous part which is seen in the anterior 2/5 between the two vocal folds and the intercartilaginous part which is seen in the posterior 2/5 between the vocal processes of both the arytenoid cartilages this picture here shows us the same the anterior 3/5 of the rima glottidis is intermembranous seen as an elongated triangular structure in normal breathing while the posterior 2/5 is the intercartilaginous part the part between the vocal processes of the two arytenoid cartilages and during normal breathing it is seen as a rectangular opening thus during normal breathing the rima glottidis is symmetrically shaped as a pentagon let us see different shapes of the rima glottidis The diagram number A shows us the shape of the rima during quiet normal breathing wherein it looks as symmetrical pentagonal in shape with the intermembranous part being a elongated triangle and the intercartilaginous part is rectangular in shape. The picture B shows us the shape of the rima in full inspiration which is diamond shaped due to abduction of the vocal cords here in the entire glottis is maximally opened to allow maximum inspiration of air the diagram c shows us the shape during high pitched sound which is like a linear chink shaped manner because of abduction of the vocal cords while the picture d shows us the shape during whispering voice which looks like an inverted funnel shaped structure with the intermembranous part being highly adducted and the intercartilaginous part is expanded triangularly movements of the rima glottidis alteration of shape of the glottis is produced by the movements of the vocal cords or the vocal folds which consists of abduction adduction tension and relaxation abduction of the vocal folds or the vocal cords is done by contraction of the posterior cricoarytenoid muscles producing a diamond shaped outline of the glottis the adduction of the vocal cords is done by the intramembranous part which is adducted by the contraction of lateral 
cricoarytenoid muscles producing an inverted funnel shaped outline of the glottis as in whispering voice while the intercartilaginous part is adducted by action of the transverse arytenoid and a pair of oblique arytenoid muscles tension or elongation of the rima glottidis this is done by contraction of the cricothyroid and partly by the vocalis muscles during this the distance between the thyroid angle and the vocal process of arytenoid cartilage is increased and the vocal fold or the vocal cords are stretched or tensed relaxation or shortening of the vocal cords this is done by contraction of thyroarytenoid and partly by the vocalis muscles when the thyroarytenoids contract the vocal folds are shortened due to approximation of both ends when vocalis contracts the anterior part of the vocal ligament is stretched and the posterior part is relaxed also the thickness of the vocal fold is increased what are the functions of rima glottidis it permits air exit in expiration and prevents air entry in inspiration thus it acts as an entry valve it acts in phonation as a voice box larynx is a tone producing organ we now go on to see the nerve supply of the larynx the sensory nerve supply the mucous membrane above the vocal folds is supplied by the internal laryngeal nerve while the mucous membrane below the vocal folds is supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve motor nerve supply all intrinsic muscles of the larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve except the cricothyroid muscle which is supplied by the external laryngeal nerve the transverse arytenoid muscle which is the only unpaired intrinsic muscle has dual nerve supply which it receives from both the recurrent laryngeal as well as the internal laryngeal nerves this picture shows us the nerves supplying the larynx what we see here is the inferior vagal ganglion and the vagus nerve descending down from it a branch coming out from the inferior vagal ganglion is a superior laryngeal nerve which splits or divides into the internal laryngeal nerve and the external laryngeal nerve internal laryngeal nerve will pierce through the thyrohyoid membrane and go on to the inner aspect of the larynx while the external laryngeal nerve goes down to supply the cricothyroid muscle also seen here is a branch coming from the vagus the recurrent laryngeal nerve which also goes internally to supply the intrinsic muscles of the larynx thus the nerve supply of larynx can be summarized like this the vagus nerve giving the superior laryngeal nerve which then divides into internal laryngeal and external laryngeal nerve the internal laryngeal nerve is sensory above the vocal cords the external laryngeal nerve is motor to the cricothyroid muscle the vagus giving the recurrent laryngeal nerve which is sensory below the vocal cords and is motor to all the intrinsic laryngeal muscles except the cricothyroid muscle going on to the blood supply of larynx above the vocal folds the arterial supply is done by the superior laryngeal artery which is a branch of the superior thyroid artery below the vocal folds the inferior laryngeal artery 
which is a branch of the inferior thyroid artery takes care of the arterial supply. The rima glottidis has dual blood supply from both these vessels. Nerves correspond to the arteries here. This picture shows us the blood supply of larynx. We see the arterial supply first. This here is the common carotid artery which divides to form the external carotid and the internal carotid arteries. The first anterior branch of the external carotid artery is the superior thyroid artery which gives a branch the superior laryngeal artery which pierces the thyrohyoid membrane and supplies the upper part of the larynx above the vocal folds. What we see here is the subclavian artery. One of its branch, the thyrocervical trunk, gives out the inferior thyroid artery which gives a branch that is the inferior laryngeal artery which supplies blood to the inferior part of the larynx below the vocal folds. The venous drainage, the superior laryngeal vein which drains into the superior thyroid vein which in turn drains into the internal jugular or the common facial vein. The inferior laryngeal vein which drains into the inferior thyroid vein which drains into the left brachiocephalic vein. We now go on to see the lymphatic drainage of larynx. Above the vocal folds, the lymph drains into the prelaryngeal and jugulodigastric lymph nodes. Below the vocal folds, it drains into the pretracheal and paratracheal group of lymph nodes. The rima glottidis thus acts as a water shed line of the larynx. The picture here shows us the prelaryngeal and the jugulodigastric group of lymph nodes which drain lymph from above the vocal folds and the pretracheal and the paratracheal group of lymph nodes which drain lymph from the area below the vocal folds. Now we move on to see the applied anatomy of larynx. Laryngoscopy is a diagnostic procedure to visualize the interior of the larynx. It is done in two ways or there are two types of laryngoscopies, indirect laryngoscopy and direct laryngoscopy. Indirect laryngoscopy is done using a laryngeal mirror which is introduced to the oral cavity and also assisted by pulling the anterior part of the tongue forwards. Direct laryngoscopy is done by using a tubular endoscopic instrument called the laryngoscope. This what you see here is the laryngoscope and these are the two types of laryngoscopies. The indirect laryngoscopy done with the help of a laryngeal mirror introduced into the posterior part of the oral cavity and the anterior part of the tongue being pulled forwards and here this shows us the direct laryngoscopy where the laryngoscope is introduced into the oral cavity and the larynx is directly visualized. The examination of the vocal cords can give various findings and these are pictures of different findings which we get to see. These are how the normal vocal cords appear. These vocal cords show the presence of ulceration contact ulcers of the vocal cords. The third picture here shows us a laryngeal polyp. Next we see nodules on the surface of the vocal cords. The next picture shows us the unilateral paralysis of the vocal cord where the paralyzed vocal cord lies in the paramedian position. And the last picture here shows us malignant or cancerous growths on the vocal cords. Lesions of the laryngeal nerves. The nerves are vulnerable during operations of the thyroid gland because of the close relationship between them and the arteries. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve may be involved in a bronchial or esophageal carcinoma or in secondary metastatic deposits in the mediastinal lymph nodes. Right and left 
recurrent laryngeal nerves may be damaged by the malignant involvement of the deep cervical lymph nodes. During partial thyroidectomy, when the recurrent laryngeal nerve is cut accidentally on one side, the patient comes with the following complaints. The affected rima glottidis is fixed in the paramedian position while the opposite side rima moves freely and even crosses the midline to meet the affected vocal fold. The voice becomes hoarse and the person has no difficulty in breathing as the normal side rima or the normal side cord is crossing or it is coming beyond the midline compensating for the affected vocal fold. So, there is no difficulty in breathing. Surgical involvement of both the recurrent laryngeal nerves wherein both the rima lie fixed in the paramedian position, the patient is aphonic and has difficulty in breathing on slight exertion. This may require tracheostomy. Cadaveric position of the rima. When recurrent and external laryngeal nerves are involved on both the sides, the rima glottidis are further abducted and fixed due to paralysis of all the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. Here we need to know the Simmons law. It enunciates that in chronic involvement of the recurrent laryngeal nerves, the abductors of the larynx are paralyzed first, followed by the other muscles. A growing tumor or a vascular aneurysm compressing the recurrent laryngeal nerve obeys the Simmons law. Next we see fractures of the laryngeal skeleton. The laryngeal fractures may result from blows received in sports such as boxing and hockey or from the compression of a shoulder strap during an automobile accident. These laryngeal fractures produce submucous hemorrhage and edema, respiratory obstruction, hoarseness of voice and sometimes a temporary inability to speak. Let us now see the important anatomical axis for an endotracheal intubation. The upper airway has three axes that have to be brought into alignment to view the glottis adequately through a laryngoscope and these three axes are the axis of the mouth, the axis of the pharynx and the axis of the trachea. And how do we do that? The procedure says, first the head is extended at the atlanto-occipital joints. This brings the axis of the mouth into the correct position. Then the neck is flexed at the cervical vertebrae C4 to C7 by elevating the back of the head off the table with the help of a pillow and this brings the axis of the pharynx and trachea in line with the axis of the mouth. Tracheostomy A surgical procedure wherein a transverse incision is taken through the skin of the neck and the anterior wall of the trachea is called tracheostomy. It establishes an airway in patients with upper airway obstruction or respiratory failure. An opening is made in the trachea between the first and second tracheal rings or between the second through fourth tracheal rings. Once the procedure is done, the tracheostomy tube is inserted and secured safely. Now we go on to see the Hemlich maneuver which is what we saw in our clinical case scenario. This is a procedure to remove aspired 
foreign bodies a sub diaphragmatic abdominal thrust is given to expel the foreign object from the larynx or the pharynx sudden compression of the abdomen which causes the diaphragm to elevate and compress the lungs expelling the air from the trachea into the lungs the procedure is as follows the closed fist with the base of the palm facing inward is placed on the victim's or patient's abdomen between the umbilicus and the xiphoid process of the sternum the fist is grasped by the other hand and forcefully thrust inward and superiorly forcing the diaphragm superiorly this creates an artificial cough and expels the foreign object this was exactly what was done to our man in the case scenario which we have seen and that is what has helped in expelling the piece of meat which was stuck at the back of the pharynx next we see laryngeal polyps these are most common lesions of the vocal cords and are generally benign usually present symptoms of hoarseness acute airway obstruction from laryngeal polyps is uncommon nevertheless a large polyp may cause airway obstruction this we see a laryngoscopic view of the vocal cords showing presence of the laryngeal polyp laryngeal cancer incidence is high in individuals who smoke cigarettes or chew tobacco they present with persistent hoarseness of voice often associated with otalgia and dysphagia that is ear ache and difficulty in swallowing they also show presence of enlarged pretracheal and paratracheal lymph nodes laryngectomy may be performed in severe cases vocal rehabilitation is done by using an electrolarynx a trachea esophageal prosthesis or by training the patient in esophageal speech this again shows a laryngoscopic view of a cancerous growth which is seen on the vocal cords foreign bodies in laryngopharynx may lodge in the piriform fossa which lies just lateral to the airy epiglottic folds if the object is sharp it may pierce the mucous membrane and may injure the internal laryngeal nerve which is just related or lies deep to the mucous membrane covering the lateral wall of the piriform fossa the superior laryngeal nerve and its internal laryngeal branch are also vulnerable to injury during removal of these foreign objects this may result in anesthesia of the laryngeal mucous membrane as far inferiorly as the vocal folds that is in cases where the superior laryngeal nerve or its internal laryngeal branch is damaged foreign bodies in the larynx are often removed under direct vision with the help of a pharyngoscope next we see laryngo seal this may be congenital or acquired they are often seen in glass blowers due to continual forced expiration producing increased pressures in the larynx which leads to dilatation of the laryngeal ventricle this picture here shows us the cavity of the larynx and this here on the right side is the normal saccule which is nothing but a mucus dilatation seen in the sinus of the larynx this mucus dilatation if it further dilates and prolongs outwards and laterally grows laterally towards the thyroid laminae if it 
is limited within the larynx it is an internal type of a laryngoseal if it further grows it may pierce the thyrohyoid membrane and further dilate to form an external laryngoseal which may appear as a mass or a swelling in the anterior part of the neck so laryngoseal is a congenital anomaly seen in the supraglottic part of the larynx they form as a result of air or fluid filled dilatations of the laryngeal ventricle which communicate with the laryngeal lumen inferiorly they can be classified as internal laryngoseal or external laryngoseal internal laryngoseals are comprised of a collection of air or serous fluid and mucus in the anterior portion of the laryngeal ventricle external laryngoseals enlarge and their sac may protrude through the thyrohyoid membrane and may present as a mass in the anterior part of the neck thus we have seen the entire topic of larynx we started off with the case presentation of helmlich maneuver we went on to see the extent of the larynx the laryngeal skeleton which was made up of the nine cartilages the ligaments membranes the joints the muscles which are the extrinsic and the intrinsic muscles of larynx we went on to see the cavity of larynx its subdivisions then we moved on to see the nerve supply blood supply lymphatic drainage of larynx we also went on to see the various applied anatomy aspects of the larynx during which we had a clearer view of what the helmlich maneuver was and how it had helped in expelling the piece of meat from the posterior part of the pharynx from our man which we studied in the clinical case scenario thank you